This is the commentary box. To me, tweeting was something that birds did. Leicester City are the champions of the Premier League. Dilly come on. Heather. Heather vai aguentar bem, encoste ele, falta apoio ali sobre o lado direito, sai rebate e o gol! And the celebrations begin. Hello and welcome to the commentary box. Today I am joined by Jake as always. How are you, Jake? I'm good, Sam. Very excited for our third show. It's, um, it's going to be a good one. Um, how was your weekend of football, or just your weekend in general? Well, my weekend of football for Gillingham uh, was very, very good. We are now... 13 games with one loss and in our last six game we had the best form in the league so I'm very very happy right now you've turned it around you've turned it around you should we be have. very happy and it's of course Swansea are playing tonight so my football weekend hasn't ended yet and it will probably end in tears tonight <laughs> but that's that's our teams but we'll get straight into what we're going to be talking about um, today we're going to be talking about the prices of defenders later on we're going to be talking about transfers and Chelsea's plan B which if you've been on Twitter Twitter or any news websites recently, you'll maybe have a have a laugh about who they think about trying to sign, or maybe not having a laugh. Um, and then, of course, we can't really not talk about Marco Silva being sacked from Watford. But we shall get on to our first segment shortly. So, on to the prices of defenders. Now, we conducted a poll on our Twitter page, which you can follow at Box Commentary, asking a very, very good question here, which is whether Van Dyke is worth 75 million. And I shall pass you over to Jake to let you know the results. Yeah, so we had uh, seven votes, not as many as last week, but still a good, good amount. And it came to 71%, so quite a big majority, saying that no, Virgil van Dijk is not worth 75 million. So that leaving 29% saying he is. And my personal opinion on this one was that I don't think he was. However, I think the question itself could be a bit vague. So saying, is he worth 75 million? Is that comparing him to other defenders because Liverpool, who obviously bought uh, Virgil van Dijk from Southampton for £75 million, they were in a, a state where they had to bring a defender quickly. They wanted him. He wanted uh, to go to Southampton. I'm pretty sure he, uh, he might have handed in a transfer request at Southampton to go to Liverpool. I can't remember. Something happened where he basically made it obvious he wanted to leave the club. Um, and so Southampton knew this, so they obviously increased their price. So, yes, possibly overpaid. But, Sam, you don't quite agree with that do you quite think he was valued at that i think he is worth 75 million to be honest i think that he's performed really well for southampton in the last two seasons i've watched videos of like his stats and he's always one of the t constant performers in terms of like headers clearances of any top center back in the premier league and i think as he's such a tall player as he's such an experienced player now in the premier league i think you've got to pay that money for a player like him because uh, you were discussing to me off air whether other players would be worth that and I think they would and, and I think he is worth that money for Liverpool in terms of needing him and his quality yeah I, I see I see the point I see especially if I'm looking from a Liverpool perspective they needed him he wanted to go you've got to pay that money in today's market to be getting those top players now he is a top player I'm not denying that at all um, I think, in general, obviously, as we all know, the football market has uh, just exploded in price. But I just thought that maybe it was a little too much. But then I do a couple of friends at Liverpool, and they were saying, well, who else are we expected to get in? We need a defender. Who else are we going to get in for 75 million? And I'm looking around, and I don't really see too many other names who are really going to fit that role or want to leave to a club like Liverpool very true because someone made a point about them to see having a 53 million buyout clause at Barcelona but why on earth would he leave when they're winning the title exactly yeah um, but this kind of raises a bigger question which is a phrase you'll probably hear a lot on this show because <laughs> yeah. we, like, we like to kind of start small and then go into big topics but the question is 
are defenders underpriced in the in the football market? Because we see players like Neymar leaving for two hundred million pounds, and like Mbappe, Mbappe going for money that's similar to that. And we don't see so many defenders going for big money. I mean, I've got yeah. a few examples here this season of you know Benjamin Mendy going for fifty two million from Monaco to Manchester City. Carl Walker, similar, he's gone to Manchester City for 50 million. And then we've got goalkeepers, are we counted goalkeepers in the defender kind of position? Yeah, same category, I guess. We, and like Jordan Pickford, 25 million, Edison, 35 million. But we're not seeing these big money, 100 million kind of signings. And I don't know really why. Do you, do you want to, no, do, do you have an opinion on this matter? No, that's, that's a good point because I didn't think of that before, but yeah, goalkeepers. What it, would Edison be one of the most expensive goalkeepers? I can't I think. I think he is. I think Buffon was twenty million. Yeah, I think. so that's crazy. Like you see Neymar going for two hundred. Yes, one amazing player. But I think goalkeepers are definitely one of the most important players on the pitch. I'd say them. I'd say they. I, I don't know if they are the most important, or maybe strikers. Cause obviously, you have to score to win games. But I definitely say they're like the second, or uh, at least, in most important player on the pitch. And. Um, so influential on the game and having a really good experienced goalkeeper behind a back four can make a massive massive difference but yeah that's really interesting but then if you look a couple of years ago say when Pogba went to Manchester United for about 89 million or whatever it was and then the most expensive defender at that point I think was John Stone for 50 I think it was when yes, he went to Manchester yeah, uh-huh. City and there was only a 40 million gap but there still was a big gap in yeah. between and then now you've got Neymar for 200 and Van Dijk with 75 the, ba- the, the gap's almost grown although it's got more expensive to buy a defender mm-hmm. it still has grown and I, I guess you're right it is still a massive gap uh, it is quite it's quite it's fascinating why it is I, I just presume as Obviously, striker scoring the goal wins you the game. I think also on a commercial matter, like though on the playing pitch, they're all worth equal amounts because they all are part of a team. And it's to, to succeed, you've all got to contribute. And I think, but when people watch football and say if they're not big football fans, they might just see the strikers. They only know the strikers because they're the ones making the headlines. They're the ones scoring. It's like Messi and Ronaldo. They happen to be both strikers, and I and I can't really think of any top player in the last 100 player, hundred years that's been a defender and been like held as one of the best except Bobby Moore but I think it's a commercial side to it because people buy shirts from strikers they don't buy shirts True, from defenders like so it, kids. yeah I think if you buy a striker you're almost investing in kind of a commercial value rather than just the scoring value which kind of inflates the, pl- the prices yeah, definitely a big name. You know, little kids want to see that big striker scoring all the goals, and they're like, "Wow, Messi, Ronaldo, like Rooney back in the day." Uh, it's all that like it's, it's that excitement of scoring the goal, and they're the ones who give the fans that excitement. They're the ones who mainly get the chance, and it's it's all about them. But there's there's an interesting point that one of my friends mentioned to me the other day, and he can we talk about football and basketball, and we're saying and they were saying in basketball there was someone who said something online I can't remember, and he said something about having one important player in your team in basketball can win you matches mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and because they can be so influential but in football you need a whole really good team because it's a, it's a I know they're both team sports but it's more of a team sport in the way that if you've got Messi in a team if Messi are playing for Gillingham yes he would score <laughs> you wish <laughs> we, he, he would score week in week out but I think we'd be better by breaking down that money and developing the team as a whole I know it doesn't always work, as we saw when Bale left um, for Real Madrid and Tottenham upgraded their squad, but it wasn't quite as good. Now, obviously, it's improving a lot, and we've seen that uh, develop in the future. But at first, when they brought in players like Paulinho and that, it wasn't that good. But anyway, off topic, that was. Um, going back to it, I think in football, you have to spend big across the whole team. Mm-hmm. and But then still, you wonder why defenders would be so low, because in theory, they'd be the same but I think the commercial value definitely definitely plays part yes agreed now that ends this segment about defenders if you want to kind of like share your opinion you can email us at either you can email us at our email which is the commentary box dot contacts at gmail dot com and you can just kind of express your opinions there you asked me a question last week didn't you I did yeah. and that question to remind uh, the viewers was in 2010 Manchester City signed 
uh, a player from Valencia for 25 million. And I asked Sam who that player was. And Sam, do we know? Well, before you gave me the clue of the player already like staying... Oh, yeah, the yeah, current be, player, that clue. Yeah, I, I thought it was Negredo because he was obviously a Valencia player. Mm. But then you said, of course, he wasn't at the club anymore. So then I went to think about Fernandinho... I sort of researched this <laughs> at this point, and of course he hadn't. And then it came to me, of course, it's um, Silver. Mm. Yeah, so um, not sure if that counts or not as a point. We will, <laughs> we will come up with some tally. I think it would be a good idea yes. week in, week out. From next week, <laughs> yeah, or this week's question. Yeah, yeah. definitely. be a good idea. Keep a, an ongoing record of see how we do. And, of course, any questions that you guys uh, want to put in, probably uh, Twitter at Bot Commentary would be the easiest with you yes. guys just send us a question and um, yeah we'd love to answer it and maybe give you a shout out of course and now on to this question for this week which is which defender has scored the most Premier League goals at 40 goals 40. is that just in general or this um, oh, it wouldn't be this no. goal for the <laughs> yeah. 40 goals yeah but the most in the Premier League year is in, it, in the Premier League in year history yeah. mm-hmm. oh that's a good question yeah I will I will need to think about that. Yeah, and if you, of course, if you know the answer, you can email in or contact us via Twitter. But that brings us to our next segment. And now we shall talk about transfers. Because, of course, the January transfer window is still open. And we will be focusing on Chelsea's Plan B. Now, it's been kind of kind of going around in the media lately about lots of different players kind of being speculated to going to Chelsea. And there's been quite... Some odd ones, really. I mean, Peter Crouch, if you've seen on the media, he's been linked. <laughs> Ashley Barnes, Andy Carroll. I mean, these are all kind of not plays you would expect to kind of is the right word. get a move to a big club at this point in their career. Um, and I think it's actually just a fascinating topic, topic to talk about, really. I mean, Chelsea have Morata hasn't been working that great I think no. hasn't scored many this season and I think Conte really wants a player that can kind of he can turn to if they're saying drawing a game or losing a game where he can just kind of lump the ball up and see see what happens but do you have an opinion on this kind of matter on like whether Chelsea need a plan B whether you think Peter Crouch could actually make a move to Chelsea <laughs> well, it's a very recent topic that's just come up really and I thought when they had Costa, I thought he sort of did both of those jobs. I thought he's good, a good, strong player, good in the air to hold up. So if they are desperate for that route one. But I also thought he was good at his feet, quite quick, uh, quite clever with his runs. I know he's quite an aggressive player and a bit, um, you could be a bit risky to have him on the pitch. But I thought he was a, a good player who did well for them. And I guess looking, you would want to have that route one option just in case to bring on which is completely fair enough, but I just think some of the players linked in, like Crouch and Barnes, um, I don't think they're that good. I don't think Barnes has scored that many goals in the Premier League, has he? No, no. um, I've got a few stats about the players. I'm I'm prepared. Um, Peter Crouch, he's actually one of the only players to have scored 100 Premier League goals, but he's only scored four this season, and that's all right for his age, but... Is it really what Chelsea needs? I mean, of course, we'll actually get to see maybe the um, the robot celebration oh, yeah. at Stamford Bridge, which would be absolutely amazing, to be honest. I, in my personal opinion, I hope Crouch does get a move like this. <laughs> um, but then on to Ashley Barnes, in a bit more serious matter. He's only scored 14 goals in 85 Premier League appearances for Burnley, and that's over this season, last season, and then the season when they were re- relegated. Um and I know they might want someone to kind of hold up the ball. And I think Ashley Barnes has done this, when, especially last year with Andre Gray. But are they also looking for a goal scorer? Because I don't think Ashley Barnes can actually provide the goals. He might be able to provide the assists, but I don't think he's the goals kind of guy. And then we move on to Andy Carroll, who, yeah. <laughs> of course, already had a big chance at a big club when he moved to Liverpool. But apparently he is now injured for three months with, I think it is, um, a hairline fracture. So I think that deal is off the cards. But there is one serious suggestion, actually, and that is Edin Dzeko, who, of course, played for Manchester City. Yeah, he... um 
good player. I, I really liked him. I thought it was when he went from City, I was a bit disappointed because I enjoyed seeing him play on Match of the Day or the occasional game that I watched. Uh, I think if he's a good player. I think he would do that job of hold up. Would he want to be a player that would go on the bench? Not sure. I know when he he went from City, I think he went to Roma. Yeah. Uh, yep. I think he had a really good season, or what the one after. One of the seasons, I know he played well. He got quite a lot of goals. Is he still at Roma? Yes, he's still at Roma. Still I watched him last night because <laughs> I was watching a bit of Roma versus Inter Milan. And he's done really, really well at Roma. And, of course, he did really, really well at Manchester City. I mean, at Manchester City, he got 50 goals in 130 games in the Premier League. And he helped them win the title in 2011, their first ever Premier League title. Title, um, sorry, 2011 12 season. And at Roma, though he hasn't won any trophies with Roma, he's helped them kind of get their resurgence up the league into the four, top four. And he's scored 61 goals in 116 games in all competitions. And watching him, I think I watched him when I was actually out in Rome well, on holiday, I watched him play and he he's a brilliant striker because he can hold up the ball he can latch onto runs he's tall he's physical and I think if Chelsea really want a striker like that they should spend big and go with Dzeko to be honest yeah I think it'd be a good signing for them if they do it I don't know if he would want the move I don't know if he'd want to return to the Premier League um, possibly but then obviously Conte working in Italy previously Dzeko now there could be maybe not similar style of football but I think that would just be a bit of a little background yeah, to sort yeah. of help them because it'd be like we've both, we've both been in that league we know that league very well Sheko already knows the Premier League um, I think he would fit in nicely a, yeah perfect player for Conte I'm surprised he hasn't been interested in him before mm. I mean of course at the start of the season they were interested in Fernando Rente which they lost out to, um, to um, Tottenham but he's a very similar player to Dzeko and I think Conte must be in the market for someone that, like Dzeko and like Garente and we'll probably see a transfer soon whether we'll, it will be a um, robot at Stamford Bridge or Ashley Barnes may be, may be um, questionable but we'll definitely see I reckon another striker heading their way to Stamford Bridge certainly hopefully <laughs> anyways on to Silver and Silver being sacked by Watford yeah so looking at that I was really shocked when it happened. I mm-hmm. thought, what are they doing? I think they're 10th or 11th in the table. Yeah. Um, I, I would have thought they're doing because they're such a great start to the season. I was so shocked when it all went wrong and they started to dip in form. I'm just looking here at their fixtures. Uh, if we go back to like early December, draw against Tottenham, which is fine. Uh, lots against Burnley, not great then not against Palace, then not against Huddersfield, then not against Brighton. And then they lost to Slater and then they lost to Swansea. That is, a, that is a December with zero points. And a lot of those teams, Sam, they're teams that Watford should be beating. Like if they're really contending and keeping that really good form ahead of the beginning of the season, definitely Palace, Huddersfield, Brighton, Swansea would four definitely winnable games. Surely they'd be winning all of those. And then we go into January as well, and it doesn't really get much better. Losing to City, understandable. Um, a cup win against uh, Bristol City. Might have inspired to form in the league, which was a two-all draw at home against Southampton, and then another loss to Leicester. And it all went wrong, and Silver got sacked. Although I did see uh, something about uh, the Everton job turning his head possibly yeah yeah uh sadly i don't have any stats have any stats for you today about marcus <laughs> silver i mean it happened yesterday yesterday i think morning so i didn't have a lot of time to kind of get some stats on it because i already planned some other stuff but we, we can't not mention it because i was very shocked i saw it on instagram first mm. when i was looking through and i thought what no no i gotta be gotta be seeing things there because i thought he's done brilliant jobs at what job at watford but he hasn't won Oh, he's only won one game in 11 in the Premier League. Yeah. And that, if you think about it, that started when he kind of, there was an offer from Everton for him to be their manager. And that kind of started then. So you must think, as Watford have come out and said, it must have turned him in his head, kind of maybe got his mentality kind of changed a bit. And sadly, it's gone wrong for him there. And when at the start of the season, when people were kind of raving about them and the style of play and the, all the all the kind of really good form, yeah, 
and now it's kind of gone downhill and they're only about four points off the relegation zone so it's a surprise but it shouldn't be really to be honest because they're they are really underperforming and if they carry on like this they could find themselves in a relegation battle i guess watford are really just taking not taking any chances yeah they're just gonna go we're gonna get rid of him we're gonna bring in a new manager which they did not too long after but just going back a little bit does that really make much difference to the mentality of a player like i'm just bringing a, a rising the question of if a club wants you as a player or a manager does that affect your performance so much like i wouldn't have thought it would have made much difference but then i guess it does i uh, i think i think van dyke yeah, dropped his yeah. form as well when the liverpool thing came through um i'm just trying to think of more things on top of my head but yeah I, I don't know it's really interesting i wouldn't have thought it would have made much difference but i guess it does you got a new club coming in you're nervous you think that it's sort of highlighting the fact that you are a really good player or really yeah, yeah. good at what you're doing. Someone else wants you. You deserve better, in a way. And maybe they think, maybe I should go. And they may think, oh, I don't need to put 110% in every week because I'm already that good. And mm-hmm. possibly just affects it a little bit. But then, yeah, just, just an interesting we, yeah, thing. Yeah, it's really. an odd thing. I've never really seen it with managers. I mean, we, of course, we saw it with um, Van Dijk and then Saidio Berahino which was a bit of similar situation but for a player where he he got his head turned by Tottenham but it it is an interesting question whether it really does affect the mentality and I think it must have but I think what's what's the odd thing is is they've brought in a manager that has no Premier League experience to his name of course when Marco Silva he had a tiny bit with Hull but now they brought in Javi Garcia not Garcia not the um, ex Manchester City player, hmm. <laughs> Javi Gracia, who was his last work. He was he last worked for um, Ruben Gazan in Russia. But he, he, I don't know a lot about him, and that might be a bit worrying because he's not really a prim- Premier League familiar name. And to stay in the Premier League, I think you really need Premier League experience or at least experience in the UK about English football. Definitely. And it's a, it's a bit it's a bit of a confusing one really, but we'll see we'll see how it pans out. And one another interesting question would be is is Marco Silva gone from the Premier League for good now, or is he going to have to go back to Europe, back to Portugal, maybe, or where to Greece where he was at before, and kind of rebuild his name? Or do you think his name is still there after a really good season with um the start of the season with Watford and a mm. kind of a unlucky ending to a, his time at Hull where he almost kept them up apart from Swansea <laughs> keeping up instead staying up instead but it does kind of raise that question as well but... yeah it's, it's an interesting point like he I think he's a good manager personally I don't think it's gonna affect it too bad I think he's still gonna be uh, one of the good managers out there and I don't think it'll take him too long till he gets the job but Looking at the new manager coming in, not being in job, uh, being in a job since June, and uh, just leaving a Russian club, Ruben Kazaz, and then he also spent a bit of time in Malaga, I'm pretty sure, and none of those he's really done that well to come to the Premier League. I know Watford aren't the biggest club in the Premier League, but to come to the Premier League and take a club knowing you're going to turn them around before they've got that low, you would have thought it would be a more uh, established manager perhaps yeah. mm-hmm. and Watford are known I guess for not taking too much time because um, reading it that here he's the 10th manager to work for Watford under the uh, Pozzo family so ah, I see I think that that stat is unfair I think sorry I think that stat is unfair because I think um, previous managers like um, Garcia ex-Brighton manager he, he had medical conditions which made him meant to, he had to leave I think a few a few managers kind of were temporary so I think that stat's a bit unfair to say they've had 10 managers in in since 2012 but it, it is a stat in itself and it does show maybe they do change the managers all too often so it'd be it'd be interesting to see how long Gracia gets it'd be interesting to see how Watford do for the rest of the season and whether they'll stay in their position they are now or kind of end in the relegation zone but sadly that is all we have time for this week we hope you have enjoyed of course if you would like to get in contact with us you can contact us via twitter at the at box commentary 
and you can just ask us questions, ask us topics you want us to talk about, any anything really, you can just get in contact. And of course, if you would like to get in contact with us via email, you can email us at thecommentarybox.contact the at gmail.com. And also, uh, make sure you're checking out our Twitter throughout the week, as we will be doing our weekly poll again, uh, which will be decided in the near future. Uh, the episode obviously will be out Wednesday for you guys. We do pre record it on Monday. But yes, Twitter, Twitter, Twitter. <laughs> Thank you for listening. We'll, we shall see you next week. We hope you enjoy your weekend of football and adios. <laughs> <laughs>